I am back, and you are flying high with me, the Zigzag Man, over the zone in Alameda, California, right across the bay from San Francisco in the northern part of California, where it's smoky as hell. And um, it's Monday. I've got a terrific guest. He's a former Major League Baseball pitcher with the New York Yankees, and um, he's here for the first time on these airwaves, Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. Larry Goel, how are you? Very good. Thank you, Zick. Very good tonight, today. How did I do it? Is, is it Goel or Goel? Well, I've been right? called a lot worse, Zig, but Goel, put a little A on the O. Uh, it, spell, it sounds like Goel, but Gawol is the way it's spelled. Gawol. All right. Gawol. And um, what uh, ethnicity is that? We're, well, I got we're some French in me, some Welsh. My father's descendants came from Wales on the Mayflower. Uh, so and then somebody said I got a little Indian in me. So I, I don't All right. Know. Well, you is know, that Native little, American you know? or uh, Indian? Yes. Indian. Yes. American. Native American. Yeah. Okay. Um, where were you born and raised? How did you uh, get to be a baseball player? Well, I, I was born and raised, uh, born in Lewiston, Maine. Uh, across, I live now in Auburn, which is across the bridge uh, from Lewiston. Uh, we call it the L.A. of the Northeast. Uh, a little okay. smaller than Los uh, Angeles. Very few. Because of the weather and the um, playing conditions, you can't play, but maybe four months a year, very few players come out of Maine. Um, were, was baseball your number one sport? How did, uh, how did it come that you pitched in the majors? Okay, well, the story goes like this. I, uh, yes, baseball was really my only sport uh, in high school, uh, and I didn't, I didn't go to college. But I started at a very young age in, in Auburn, Maine, playing, of course, Little League Ball, Police Athletic League, Colt League, on up, of course, the Legion and semi-professional uh, men's league, uh, when I was very young, but I did start very young. My father, a, a great player at a small school in Litchfield, Maine, and uh, he was a second baseman and pitcher. And he used to tell the old story that uh, we only had nine guys that went to the school, and all nine of them had to play baseball. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Because they wanted to have a baseball team. I, I always thought that was comical. Uh, That's very But anyway, cool. I started very young. I developed uh, uh, pretty good. By the time I was eight or nine, they could see I had a pretty good arm. Uh, played center field. In reality, though, I didn't start pitching until I was 11 or 12 for whatever reason. I think probably I was a little wild when they put me on the mound and they were afraid I was going to hurt somebody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good so now. actually, I didn't really, really start really pitching seriously until I was about 11, and uh, and I, I remember playing on four different teams at once, um, uh, and, and of course, as I went along, um, I started getting some recognition with my arm strength. Uh, uh, they could see that playing center field, I'd throw guys out at home plate, and they wanted to get me on the mound, and again, I was a little wild starting out, so I didn't probably pitch that much. But then I got. Larry, did right. you have did you have a youth coach, somebody who mentored you? Was it your dad? Yes, uh, I have to uh, honor a, a gentleman from California who actually came from California, Ray Bermudez. Ray Bermudez was the local coach. He coached like four or five different teams. Very knowledgeable. Uh, a man that loved working with the young people in our neighborhood. Right. And so I have to tip my hat to R the late Ray Bermudez, who uh, what was really... What was the one thing that he taught you that uh, was instrumental in your success and development? Well, I think uh, a, a, a fundamental, uh, uh, you know, uh, wind-up and delivery <laughs> okay. and follow-through uh, of the 
ball, and uh, control was the most important because uh, even if you can throw hard, if you can't, you can't throw a strike. Uh, you, 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 you can't stay in the game. You're going to lose. <laughs> okay. Uh, so um, I think he, he, he is instrumental in, in maybe uh, having me not try to overthrow and let my do it natural throwing so I'd have better control. Larry, if it wasn't baseball, what was you, what, did you have another passion? What would have been your life? Music. It's music, music. My whole family were musicians. My father was a, a fiddler. Uh, uh, my brother is a professional songwriter and guitarist, and he's written many, many songs. His music's out there. Uh, my sister was an advanced organist and pianist, and my mother was a pianist and organist, and my aunt was a pianist and organist. I was brought up in music. I At uh, parochial school, I was in the choir and played trumpet in the band, Today I am a professional singer and been singing for nine years. I had the honor to sing for the Boston Red Sox a few years oh. ago, uh, the national anthem, and I've sung in New York at the Metropolitan Club in New York City. Very, very So cool. music would be the other thing I would have done going on to school. If it wasn't for baseball, I would have loved to taken classical lessons at a young age, but it came later on in life when I took my lessons and found out I had a, a lot of talent in that area. How did how did you come to that? You were doing other things be, between playing baseball and your music. How did it come to to uh, well, your second? Music was always always there. Uh, in other words, I you know I'd sing in church. I played, I remember going, when I was in the minor leagues, I remember going to different churches. I was a Seventh-day Adventist, and that was one thing about my career that everybody's intrigued with. I did not play on Friday night and Saturday, which certainly okay. held me back, held me back in the major leagues. Not the minor leagues, it helped me. They pitched me Sunday, and they pitched me Thursday, and I, I pitched with a three-day rest. And, uh, so you were the, you were like uh, imitating Sandy Koufax is basically that. Well, he he didn't play on Young Kipper. I think it was. No, I know. It felt I like know. every every weekend, but uh, I was I was not available at the time. Uh, uh, every weekend, Friday night sundown to Saturday night sundown. So I had two strikes against me as far as making it in the big leagues long term. Who scouted you with the Yankees? Pat Colgan. Pat Cogan was the, the head uh, head uh, scout for New England, and right. uh, my coach Artie Balbo, who was a great coach at a little high school, I ended up being 16 and 0 in three years. I also was the best hitter on the team, and hitting over 400. Uh, he was a huge Yankee uh, fan, and uh, obviously in my sophomore year, junior year started to see that I was a major league prospect and, and made sure that the, the head the people of the Yankees would get over here to see me uh, pitch. Uh, I was Did the Red Sox there. get involved at all? Because you were basically... Yeah, Frank Malzone was there in a game. I pitched in, against what they call St. Dom's, a Catholic school. and I remember hitting two home runs and, and pitching a no-hitter that day. Uh, oh, wow. He was there. In front of Frank, Frank Malzone, who was a terrific third baseman with the Red Sox in the 50s. Um, yes, a great cool. guy, too. Yes, yeah, yeah. I can remember him sitting in the stands. He was a scout up here in Maine uh, for the New England area, I think. And when you were signed, did you go to rookie ball? Right off yes, the I, I signed in, in 1967. I was a fourth-round draft pick, okay, 61st in the nation, which is unheard of up here in Maine. I, uh, my status and my value went way up uh, when I, in, in uh, American Leagues in baseball, I pitched in the playoffs for the state of Maine, Auburn Legion against Bangor Legion, and I pitched a one-hitter on Friday, a nine-inning game, I had one day off rest, which was Saturday. I didn't pitch. And they pitched me again Sunday, and I pitched a no-hitter. <laughs> oh, and then in the second game, I threw out a guy from home plate uh, in the air from 340 feet after pitching two games in three days. And there was a lot of scouts there, and they said, this guy has got a rag arm. 
he can throw all day, and uh, uh, that's when I became a major prospect, and, and you know, for the major leagues. The following year, which in uh, my last year in high school, uh, the, the, the head scouts were there watching some of my very best games, and right before the draft, I pitched against Lewiston High School, who is our, our rivalry across the bridge. And in that game, I think I threw the hottest I ever did in my life. I struck out 19 in a row. I think two guys tried to bunt on me, which we caught them. And uh, I walked two and struck out 22 and pitched a no-hitter. And the head scout for the Yankees was right behind. And that was the day that I became a much higher draft pick than what they were going to get me at. I think I might have gone 10 or 15. 15th round, and my coach said, Larry, after this game, he told me, you're going to go high, and I did, 61st in the country. Beautiful. You get a bonus? Got I got uh, 60, I got 13,000 uh, up front, I got 1,500, and I got the double A, right. I got, let's see, uh, 3,500, it was uh, added up to 20,000. I did end up collecting. Now, each place that I went, I collected a bonus. When I got to the big leagues, I got another forty-five or five thousand dollars. So at least I collected all the bonuses <laughs> that I. That, had Larry, who told you you were going to the big leagues? Uh, Bobby Cox. Uh, oh wow! I was in West Haven, Connecticut, uh, having a phenomenal year. They should have brought me up earlier. They brought up Ron Klimkowski instead about the middle part of the year. I uh, had won my last 11 games in a row, uh, and I was pitcher of the year, I think, that year there in AA. And they brought me up. Of course, Bobby took me in the office and said that uh, the the Yankees have called and called, and they want you up there, you know, get in the car and get the – get to Yankee Stadium. And I said, wow. I said, well, time, this small-town guy – from Auburn, Maine, is going to make it to the to the show. Who was the first person you called? Huh? Who was the first my person father. you called? My, my father. Yeah. Cool. My father. He was a uh, he was my biggest fan. And uh, and he met you. Biggest, he met you. Biggest bracket you'd ever ever want to meet. <laughs> <laughs> and he met you in New York. Am I correct? So oh, you, yes. Uh, my dead, whole family dead, came from when they started. When I started my first game, of course, we all knew it several, a couple of days prior or a day prior. Uh, the Yankees had, were losing at the end of the year. We lost our last five games. So we got out of into fourth place, had no chance to even go to third place. So I pitched my first game in relief in Milwaukee. And um, and then I came out. I think I came in for Sparky Lyle. I'm pretty sure. And I pitched two perfect innings. And um, and so we had lost a couple more games. And uh, Ralph Hulk said, Larry, we're going to give you the honor to start the last game of the year. Uh, we're not in it. We want you to show your stuff like you have been. And they're certainly going to be here next year. They they gave me all the all the. Uh, uh, optimism that I was going to be in the, in the in the in the with the Yankees in 1973. I was one of the last ones that was cut, actually. But anyway, and uh, so I got the opportunity to say, play that game, and got the opportunity to pitch against the great Len Jim Lomborg, and um, and finally I got my uh, my hit, my only time at bat. I got a double uh, off Jim Lomborg in Yankee Stadium, a three-two high oh, wow. fastball. And, and Do you remember what number you wore? I wore 45. All right. I want you to listen to this. Now batting for the Yankees, number 45, Larry Goel, number 45. <laughs> How's that sound? That sounds great, Zig. You, you, you got that <laughs> down really good. <laughs> it's my only talent, Larry. I can't sing, I can't play baseball, but I could uh, imitate Bob, Bob Shepard of the great St. John's educator who was uh, the voice that I heard growing up as a kid in Yankee Stadium um, 
It was yep. pretty cool. Oh yes, it was fantastic. Yeah. So did you did you shiver a little bit when when he announced your name? Oh well, I you know again you're you know you work your whole life and you dream of a moment in time where you're going to walk into a into a major league stadium and you're going to perform. Uh, no, I don't think there's any human being on earth that would say that they're not nervous and their legs aren't shaking somewhat when they walk onto that field and go to the mound for the first time. Which one of your teammates greeted you and uh, helped you when you first came up, and uh, who kind of ignored you and dissed you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, ignored me? I don't know. I um, I don't recall anybody ignoring me. I think who helped you, time, Larry? You know, I who made you feel some, good? The Papa and Mike made me feel good. I think. Uh, you know, I remember when I went out for the first time in Milwaukee, and he said, "Larry, he says you're here because you deserve to be here, and you you got the stuff to get these guys out. So just keep throwing your stuff. Don't worry about it. I'll handle it behind the plate. Just I throw down a sign. You just throw your pitch." I said, "Okay, Sturman, that sounds good. I'll give it my best." <laughs> Not too bad. And you were like the final cut in the next year in spring training. Yeah, I was the final cut. Yeah, yeah. I um, I had a few bad games that weren't super. I pitched pretty good, but I uh, I uh, I had a game or two. Again, I, I'm still fighting the Adventism, and they thought they would change me. They thought, of course, that I would I would change my religion. They had me actually roommate with Lindy McDon Lindy McDaniel's, who was a Church of Christ minister. Oh. And they actually tried to convert me to another religion. <laughs> did you ever get to meet Vaughn McDaniel, his brother? I never did, no. Oh, just never did. Uh, curious about that. There were two brothers that played in the majors. Uh, yep. Vaughn was with St. Yeah. Louis. Oh, again, I was only up there a short time. I was up there during spring training. I was up in the major leagues for only one month. And, and uh, um, how did your career go in the minors after? Were you hurt? Is that how? Well, no, how? I, I did very well. I played Puerto Rico. I played all the tough leagues in the winter leagues. I played Santo Domingo, uh, Puerto Rico in 70, 71 after my big year in Fort Lauderdale, which, which put me on the map when I when I struck out 217 hitters and won 16 games with 17 complete games, I think it was. Uh, was there any? Was there ever any decision to make about whether you'd be a pitcher or a position player? Oh no, no, I was not. I was not good enough to be a position player. I, I was a good hitter in high school, and I got my hit off Jim Lomborg, and I'm batting a thousand in the big leagues. But, but no, <laughs> there was never any thought of me being an everyday player. I, my arm was was where my talent was, and I had a, what they call a rag arm. I really never missed, I think, one start in my whole career. And that's oh, pitching wow. winter ball. That's pitching all summer. Uh, that's pitching some years over 250 innings uh, between winter ball and regular base. My regular summers with the Yankees. Uh, so Larry, I, I how did you re, how did how did you adopt to not being a ball player to not being a pitcher? How did uh, how did you get your competition in? Um, the wheels the wheels are turning, I'm sure. Um, do you play golf? Do you play tennis? Oh yeah. Does that okay. work? When I got out of baseball, what did I? How did I transfer into the regular life? <laughs> Is that yeah? And how about that that competition, the energy? Yeah, I uh, I played slow, slow pitch softball. <laughs> okay. And uh, I uh, I remember hitting a lot of home runs and hitting six eighty or whatever. Uh, I today I I went into the insurance business after getting out, uh, which worked out pretty well. And uh, all right. And I played golf, and I, I again I played slow pitch softball. I remember going to Florida and some all star teams. From where I lived, and we went all the way down to play some good teams in Florida. And uh, I enjoyed playing slow pitch softball. Could hit the ball a long way, and uh, and, and and that was fun. I, I play a lot of golf today. I'm semi-retired, but I'm singing a lot. I do about 150 concerts a year, so that 
at 69, almost 70. I'm, I'm staying very active. I play golf uh, three times a week and, uh, and nice. I have my singing. And th- this part hey, of say somebody wanted uh, you to sing at their bar mitzvah. How would they get in touch with you? Hey, just give me a, I'm, I'm right on the end. Well, it doesn't have to be a bar mitzvah, Larry. <laughs> no, it doesn't. I, uh, just <laughs> call me at Larry, uh, call me at 207 318 Four one two eight, and I'm happy to do a gig anywhere. I, I just go. Okay. Talk. Do you have a you have a Facebook account? Um, Facebook. Anybody can find me on Facebook at Larry Gowell. Just put in Larry Gowell. I also have a right. baseball page, Larry Gowell, New York Yankees. Uh, nice. I also have a baseball card that just came out, and uh, it's by Tops. And uh, I just put it out uh, 10 days ago. I've sold over 63, and I've only got 23 left that I'll be selling. And it's available on eBay. Just go to eBay and put well, in my name. You had a Larry. Tops card when you played, and you're just getting re- reproductions of the card? How does that work? Right. This, is, this worked this way. Somebody called me about a month and a half ago and said, Tops is selling your negative on eBay. Tops never put out a card on me because I was not in the major leagues long enough, right? Right. So they held the negative, and now they're selling it. The guy said, you ought to buy it. I said, well, probably I will. <coughs> so I went ahead and bought the negative, and then I thought, I want to make up my own card because many people ask me, do you have a card? And uh, since I was the last pitcher to get a hit before the DH, uh, and uh, I, that baseball's in the Hall of Fame, I figured that maybe I, I might have a market out there. And sure enough, through Facebook, I've connected with many Yankee fans all over the country. I've got, just got an order today from Florida, come from California. I got one guy that bought seven of my cards as a collector. Uh, oh, wow. I bought seven of my cards, and uh, it's you know, I'm only making up 96, and some of them I'm giving away to my family. Uh, so it's a very limited edition. Uh, Fritz Peterson has been promoting it for me too. So the whole thing here is that that card is, is connected to the designated hitter rule change in 1973, as Ron Bloomberg was the first hitter up. And I was the last. He was. He was a guest on these airwaves. As a matter of fact, was. Oh, he was. Yes, he was. was. And uh, what a what a terrific guy, a Jew from the South. uh, Oh yeah, from from Georgia. Ron and I are friends. We're in connection with each other. I saw him in Portland, Maine, here a few years ago, and he's done very well in in signings, and he's 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 done very well as the first DH. He's. uh, He's de- definitely done well with that. I didn't. I crazy. never realized that you were the last uh, pitcher to bat before the, the DH. That's an uh, incredible feat. Well, it's just uh, something that I just happened to get up at that moment. I didn't find out until 1993 that I, that I was the last pitcher to get hit. It ended up in trivia, a baseball trivia game or something. And then, and then somebody wrote to me from 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 Honolulu, Hawaii, who was a who was a very uh, 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 trivia buff, and told me he had all the proof that I was the last pitcher. He said, "I've got it right here." I said, "Nolan Ryan got up. He was the last pitcher to get up later on in the evening, and he didn't get a hit." Bert Blylevin got up early in the day and. And, and he got a double. And you got your hit around nine nine o'clock in New York Eastern Standard Time. He said, "You have you are the last pitcher to get a hit." He said, "Wow, take all my documents, send it to the Hall of Fame, and let them let them check it all out." And then he said, "You might want to give it to him." And I did that. I gave it to him. It was valued at fifty four hundred dollars at the time. And now they told me just a few months ago I was over there and did a nice video about the ball. I have it on my Facebook page. And I invite anybody to join me on my Facebook page, Larry Gowell or Larry Gowell, New York Yankees. 
And they can see a lot of stuff that I put up about the Yankees and about myself and my own career, if anyone's interested. Um, Beautiful. Larry, so, you're yes, a terrific guest. going guess. on. I, I'm, I'm very happy. 63 sales in, in 10 days. I mean, that's not bad for for kind of an unknown unknown. <laughs> Ball now, who made the anyway. card up for you? Did Tops make the card up as well? Yes. Yeah, so what happened was, I finished my story. Yes, I, I called Tops after getting the card. And I said, can you make me a card? And they said, sure. He says, I have all the rights since I bought the negative. You didn't put the card out, so I'm going to put it out. So they said, we'll make up a really nice card. And it is very nice. I got many people that have sent their picture taken with it. Some of the big collectors said it's, this is a great story. One historian, Ron F- Fisco, I think his name is, in New York, he's the biggest New York fan. His basement is made like New York in Yankee Stadium, said that this is the most uh, conversational piece I've ever seen. He said, I know the Yankees inside and out. I know Ron Bloomberg. I knew I had no idea that Larry Gow and Ron Bloomberg were tied to the TH and Jim Lonborg, and that I was the last hitter and he was the first hitter. We also were roommates. Ron Bloomberg and I were roommates. So we are wow. all connected. Louis Tiant's also connected to El the President. Yes, yeah, right. I just talked to Louis today. I have a baseball signed by myself, Jim Lomborg, Ron Bloomberg, and now Louis lives right here in Maine. He's going to sign my baseball. It's going to be officially the DH ball. And uh, so I'm doing that for my family. My son is a big high school coach down in North Carolina, and i got a grandson coming up through, 5'10", 200. He's throwing great as a left-hander, great control, and we're looking at him to make the high school team in the eighth grade. Uh, wow. Uh, so I'm very excited about my family uh, and uh, my future, uh, which is my grandson, uh, Tucker, and my son, Chad, who's a great coach down there uh, in North Carolina. How did he become a coach? Did he play ball first? Um, right. He went to UNC. Um, Robert saw him pitch a perfect game. He was a great pitcher in, in, uh, in high school, and, uh, great control. I uh, hurt his arm uh, just before the last game of the year. He had tons of tons of scouts there. He had hurt his back and couldn't bend over, and he actually got bombed in a playoff game. And so he didn't get drafted uh, for that moment in time. But he did He did go to UNC uh, and uh, didn't quite make it scholastically his first year. So he redshirted ended up at Mount Olive, if you know much about Mount Olive, one of the top. I've heard, heard of that, yeah. Yeah, Mount Olive. Not, that's where they, they make pickles. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, he became a great, great player, first baseman for Mount Olive. He just was put into the Hall of Fame there just last year. It has many, many records and did play independent ball for a couple of months, but he had hurt his arm his junior year. He would have definitely had a, had a good contract, but he did hurt his arm his junior year and oh, didn't come back true. until right at the end of his college career. Uh, so he did play a little bit of pro ball, yes. And now he's a great coach, a great coach. He led his uh, high school team. Uh, to uh, division uh, number two in the state about seven years ago, and now he's a private coach and he works with uh, with a uh, velo velo uh, sports down there. Uh, they have an indoor uh, area where where he coaches many many kids and also coaches the road teams. Uh, they travel all over the country. They just came. Larry, in general, not your son in particular, I'm sure he is a great coach. What makes coaches great, in your opinion? What makes. Uh, well, first of all, they've got to have knowledge. They've got to be a student of the game. Uh, they have to be patient. Uh, I think you've got to yeah, be a good, patient with kids. That's a, a good word, patience. I'm not patient. I'm not that patient. I, I would love to work with only the elite. I, I could work with the elite players, like in the when a state, top ten players, best pitches. I don't have I don't have much patience. Uh, my son has learned that he's a great coach. He was a great student of the game from a very early age. 
he watched the game, even at 10, 11 years old, knew everything going on in the field, has become a great coach down there, and I'm very proud of him. Many, many, many of his students uh, say how great he is and so happy they're under his tutelage. Um, okay, Larry, most of, most of our audience, not a bunch of ball players, um, human beings, fans, um, in business. Right. What are some of the things I sold insurance for for a long time when I when I got out of the Air Force? Okay. So I I want to ask you what are the things that you learned in baseball that transcend to, to the right. business world that made you yeah. a success? Well, I think uh, baseball is like life, right? It's up and down. It's up and down. You know, you've got so many obstacles to get over mentally, uh, physically. I mean. There's so much, and so baseball is up and down. Nothing is always 100%, right? We're not always on top of the world when you're playing sports. So I think uh, in, in real life it transcends over into perseverance, uh, confidence, uh, believing in yourself. Uh, uh, all of these things come into it. And, yes, baseball helped me greatly as I had to, Trans, transfer into the real world of making a living rather than throwing right. a baseball. There is a big difference. Just like an army guy coming out of the army going into the going into the regular uh, you know work workforce, it, there is a big transition there. But again, I think baseball really prepares you for real life as well as any sport out there. Anything you'd do differently in your career if you had it to do all over again? I probably would have. I probably would have would have uh, changed religions at a younger age. I'm not a Seventh Day Adventist today, but I would have. Uh, I would have changed my uh, my religion and changed my thoughts about. Uh, about you were that. adamant you did not pitch on Fridays and Saturdays in the majors. Correct. And uh, again, Ooh, I, did anybody my family, understand? My, my and church they... was all behind me. My church, they put you know they put me up on a pedestal. They put me up in front of the church and how I'm holding up to the Seventh Day Adventists, uh, you know, Sabbath and and, uh, and and you know they they put me up on a pedestal and they, they made made me like a uh, you know some kind of a hero or something for the Seventh Day Adventist religion. Uh, uh, today my beliefs have changed, but my values are strong. I would say this, that uh, strong values with the Adventists, they are great people. They are the most loyal people you'll ever meet. Uh, I never did smoke or drink, okay? I did stay very healthy because they're big into nutrition, and I never did smoke and drink. I never did, you know... Uh, get into all the vices that many ball players get into that you never see in the major leagues because they stayed out all night and they drank too much. Uh, well, did you have your own special vices that you got into? Or were just not I good? didn't really. I never got into drugs. Oh, okay. I never even drank. I never even smoked to smoke uh, smoke cigarettes. I uh, you know, I never really got into any any serious vices that would affect my career. Uh, uh, and I thank God for that. Uh, wow. Many, many great, talented ball players that I saw in the minors never you never heard about them because they had a lot of things uh, they they were working through. If you drink too much, you're out too late, you're partying too much, you got to go out and pitch the next day or play the next day. I mean, after a while, that takes a toll on you. Did you get that from your dad? Did you get that idea? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah they were pretty strict uh, people, very disciplined about uh, living high-valued lives, uh, nutrition, uh, all of that. So I, I'm happy that that part of it, you know, stuck with me. I did not fall into an area where, oh, I'm going to go drink. I'm going to start drinking and booze up like the rest of these guys are doing. Right. And I was what was like your experience awful. around the war? I mean, this was we're about the same age, and I was a Vietnam era Correct. Air Force okay. guy. And what what happened there was um, in my big year in Fort Lauderdale. I was drafted, of course, in 1970. 
a 69, and that was the year I was having this awesome year in Fort Lauderdale where it put me on the map as a top prospect for the Yankees. I was 8-0 at the time when the letter came that I had to go down to Miami for a physical, and then I would go right in if I passed that physical. Well, I had flat feet. And uh, my father got three three doctors to write letters about my situation, and they advised the military not to accept me because my my body would break down uh, walking you know walking 20 miles with a 50 80 mile pound pack on your back. Right. And uh, and so it, uh, the short the, the the end of the story is. I got a 4F status, which is amazing. I got a 4F status, yet I was a, I was a, I was an able-bodied, very strong young athlete. But you had flat, you legitimately had flat feet. That, I legitimately had flat feet, and they were very concerned that that indeed, uh, you know, is going to break down on me on the on the war front, uh, carrying heavy packs on my back, and all three doctors concurred that I should not be accepted in the military for that purpose. Now, today, that changed the next year. They could have taken me for paperwork or some other area, but for that year, I found out that that they didn't take flat-footed people. So I guess I huh. lucked out in that respect because I was having a great year. I was 8-0. I won every game, and I was ended up 16-7. and I was pitcher of the year of the minor leagues. If you look at my Who was your manager record. back then and your pitching coach? Shanks. Uh, Mr. Shanks, I think. Shank, Shank. I think of his name now. Tom Shank. He owned a sporting goods store in Fort Lauderdale. Huh. Shank. Shank, I think his name. S-H-A-N-K. Shank. Can't think of his first name right now. I have to look at the records. It's a lot of but years ago. it was ago. Shank, Shank, and you'd have it, you <laughs> would have had it right there. I had, uh, Is that possible? You know, Bobby Cox Probably not, two huh? years in the there are all kinds of names are not going to give a guy the same name, right? <laughs> right, right. All right, we got that straight. Last thing I want to ask you, how did you um, – I, I saw a picture of you and our mutual friend, Marty Appel, on Facebook yes. the other day. Yes. Um, yeah. Marty was there when you came up. Um, he was a publicity guy with the Yankees. Did you get to meet him back then, or did you reacquaint later on? How are you friends now? Well, Marty was a, was a great guy. I mean, when he came in, of course, he always he always was the one to greet us, and uh, yeah, he got to know all the young guys because he knew that one of us could be great one day. Didn't know who, right? Not saying that's the reason why he did, but he was very friendly. We went out to eat a lot. Ron Bloomberg. Uh, his wife, my wife uh, at the time, and Marty used to go out to eat. We did things together. We were going to Ron's apartment there in New York City when they first came up. And we all we all spent time together. We had dinner together We uh, in spring training. Uh, so we got to know each other uh, very, very well. That would be Great pretty time. cool being a Yankee and a young man. <laughs> <laughs> and I just happened to go and hear him speak. He came into Laconia, New Hampshire, and I drove two and a half hours to see him again. I saw him about three years ago when I sang in New York City at the Metropolitan Club and came to my gig. And so I wanted to go see him and give him, you know, show him my card, my baseball card. He was excited to get one. And uh, he's a big promoter of my career and thinks I have a, a very unique career, uh, you know, a great minor league career and, of course, the not playing on Friday night and Saturday and being the last pitcher to get a hit uh, before the DH and being a part of the DH, which is the biggest change in baseball history, uh, was kind of cool. And uh, so, yeah, we, we are, we're old friends, and it was great to see him again just the other day. He was very cool. happy to see me. Very nice. Marty and I go back to days before his Yankee days, Oh, really? And my, my father's cousin owned the New York Sets. They were a te- team tennis, um, uh, uh, in the team tennis league with Billie Jean King 
and yeah. Fred Stolle was the coach and what have you. And Marty, out of college, or one of his first jobs, was uh, worked for Saul Berg, my, my father's cousin. Rest in peace, Saul. He passed away a couple of months ago. Oh, really? But, um, so he was the publicity guy for the New York sets, or the New York apples they, they became. Um, wow. Way wow. back then. Way back. Yeah. Yeah, a very talented I've, I've had him on these airwaves, and I had a great show with he and Fritz Peterson, and Marty and Fritz tell the story <laughs> about when Fritz, they were right at the end, the Yankee Stadium, the old Yankee Stadium, and Marty told Fritz, you hold the record for the lowest ERA of any Yankee pitcher who qualified under a certain amount of innings in yes. Yankee Stadium history. That's for <laughs> that and is Marty told him that. Huh? Doug Gall- a great oh, he was a terrific pitcher. Great curveball. Um, good curveball. And, uh, yes, that's a, quite a record. Think about it. Yes, uh, and um, yeah, and he and they said they both said that was one of those those drop dead moments where you just um, wow, you know they both got, <laughs> both got well. Those that's problems. wonderful that he he you know that record has come out. Marty's a great historian. He's a great communicator. He certainly deserves all the success that he has had writing his uh, many books and. Uh, I'm so happy for Marty uh, to be the success that he has become as the number so one. Did, Larry, do I get a little Acapulco? Acapulco, <laughs> that's not the name. Acapulco. Um, I've been no to music. Acapulco. Yeah, it is Acapulco. Give me a li- give me a little sound. Give me give me some uh, some of your pipes. Oh, give me some of the pipes. Okay, I don't know. Let's see. That's life. That's what all the people say. You ride high in April. High in April. You shot, shot down, down in the May. May. I don't let it. I don't May let it get me down. Because this fine old world, it just keeps spinning round. You've been I've a been pauper, a, a poet, a <laughs> pirate, a poet, a poet, and all those things. I can't remember the words, and and over my voice, and my voice stinks. <laughs> but oh, my, we my did a duet, Larry. Uh, you can, okay, uh, I'll, I'll say this. Martin you can and hear Lewis going on. Huh? I, there's a little Martin and Lewis going on here. I think we got <laughs> something. Anybody who wants to hear my music, I'm on YouTube. Just go to YouTube, right. put in my name, Larry Gowell. And you'll see all kinds of music. L-L. That's correct. Uh, O-L Gowell. And YouTube is precisely where this show will be archived. We do that oh, with really? all the shows on the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. And yes. I'll send you a link to it, and I'll send Marty a link as well. How about that? Oh, yes. He'd love that. And, again, anybody want me to do a show in New York area, I'm happy to come down. And uh, do a show. I, uh, I, I I've been thinking about uh, renaming my show the Singing Yankee. Uh, I'll wear a Yankee, my Yankee shirt and hat, and come down there and do some singing and some some places down there. I did play with the great Barry Lovett in the in New York City, the late Barry Lovett, oh, wow. just passed on at the Metropolitan Club. That is a big cabaret club right downtown right downtown New York City, and that was exciting. And Marty had come, and many of my fans came uh, to that event. And uh, that, was a, that was a high point of my musical career, and also singing with the Boston Red Sox. And you can also Larry, this is that. the high part of my, my broadcasting career, having you on. What oh, a really? <laughs> Well, thank you. It's as high as it gets, Larry. I'm not entitled to be much higher. <laughs> I may You're be very ha- kind. May have You're very kind. Law. I may be ha- have to be a scoff law to be higher than this, Larry. <laughs> well, Would you come back and fun. visit with an old man? And we'll I need do to that. Come- it was a lot of fun. The seven years I played, it was the greatest part of my life. And 
I'm singing today, and that's all I want to do is sing, and I have a great time with it. I do have a really good voice. I do get very high marks. I have taken two years of classical lessons. Anybody wants to check out my card, it's on eBay. Just put in my name. They can take a look at my baseball card. There's only about 24 left. And uh, they're going to go. They the will indeed within. become collector's items because Tops didn't have a card for you, and uh, now you uh, have your own. And this is I've made my own. I paid for my yes. own. I developed, and they're very, very nice. They're very. If you go on, go and just go on eBay. You can look at it front and back, and also see a picture of me pitching off the mound in Yankee Stadium in that in, the, in that famous game. There's another image on there. And, and, and please befriend me on, on Facebook, Larry Gowell. Uh, just put in, befriend me, and I'll befriend you back. And love to have all the Yankee fans be part of my Facebook uh, page for sure. Beautiful. I'm glad you're part of the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. You're a friend of the show, Larry. Thank you very much. It's been a lot of fun. All right. We'll see you next time. Everybody out there, please keep on keeping on. Thanks a lot, Larry. Adios, everybody.